One, two, three. So you're you're on you this side's recording instead of the other. This is Rowan Kearns interviewing this is Helen Douglas Lawson at the Woke, Oklahoma on November 18, 1971. Mrs. Lawson is not only an old time resident of Wewoka in Oklahoma, but actually was born here. She has a uh, narrative description of some of the early incidents in Oklahoma as was given her by her mother, which we will first read and then we will discuss other innocent items. Mrs. Lawson. On November the 3rd, 1897, I came to New York in New Jersey with my father, L.K. Sampson. Mother, Larry Sampson, two younger sisters, Ethel Day, Marge, and one brother. That one was 17 years old at the time. Our mother's father, John D. Minnick, was also with us, as he made his home with us. We came from the public museum in two public gardens and was three weeks on the road. My father had made a previous trip and rented the range of Presbyterian Mission, which was three miles north of Rewoka. My mother's brother-in-law, L.A. Elliott, had been living in Rewoka since 1888 and encouraged us to come to this country. We had heard stories about Rewoka for many years before we decided to come. An uncle of ours, Jim B., gave us supplies to Rewoka from his home in Southwest and was murdered as he made camp one night so many stories came from the Indian territory. We had lots of fun traveling along with the country and along the countryside it was beautiful. At meals so material my little two year old sister became very ill and being the eldest daughter I had more responsibility than the other girls. So I was told by my mother to her work out my usual white dress because I think we will have to bury her along the way to mine. I don't think she will last three six months. Besides, when Margie lives and his family is seven days to the same old time. Mm -hmm. I distinctly remember camping at Aunt Margie's, which is only a wide place on the road. We found the campsite and wished to camp along with six other families. We were going to other places in Indian territory. One morning, we had only enough water either to wash our faces or make coffee. We all voted for the coffee. Our last night in camp was close to a city junction place, northeast of the Rosa, and we were getting close to our new home and didn't have many more miles to make. <coughs> Upon rising at the mission in the late morning, we were all delighted with our new home. It was a two-story structure, rather potential to me, built of native lumber. The casing of doors and windows and stairs were of black walnut. Square iron nails were used in the construction of the building. The library was filled with many books. A lot of the books had been sent from England. The yard was spacious with many beautiful trees in the yard, and an excellent place for children to live. <coughs> Deer, wild turkeys, quail, and small game were in abundance. We considered ourselves lucky to have such a nice place to live, as many families were living in tents. This mission was called the Jerry Ross Dandy Mission and was erected in 1968, 1868 by the Presbyterian. Some of the members were Gene Baxter, Nina Hanman, Will Baxter, Ben F. Baxter, Stuart Pyles, Alice Davis, Governor John F. Brown, and John F. In 1874, John Ramsey called the first education convention ever called in Indian Territory with the building of the Imahaka Mission for girls and the Pacific Mission for Indian boys, the day off arranged the mission was closed, and that was the reason that my father was able to rent the mission for our home. When my father entered this mission, it was in the deal that we would have to room and board a Presbyterian missionary by the name of Brother Duncan for years. He had been teaching some Indian children there at the mission and also preached at the Presbyterian Indian Church. A small rock structure which was located in Rewoka and stood several feet west of what is now the Rewoka Library. This was the first church in Rewoka. Along about this time, many disputes had arisen over the two Seminole line, and most of the Indian men and boys carried in such a library. 
our law was passed to his and then saying so he died at the end of the world. So many of them had stopped at our place, leave the rockets before going on into the Europa, and then had stopped for them and returned to their home. This so far far line was close to the nation. <coughs> we came to Europa just as the Europa Southern Company was moving into the new building, where the security state line was now located and joining off to the north. It was a nice building. The guys, girls, and brokers were moving to get this building from their old station north of the railroad, where the furniture, hardware, lumberyard, and other things were kept. The I.A. Smith store building was built in the spring of 1898. Mr. Kyle Creekmore came as manager, and Steve Douglas, who later became my husband, as bookkeeper. The clerk was Jim Kingsworth, Sam Harris, Bert Smith, Jim Fleet, Jim Kelly. The first time I saw Steve, another girl and I went to the post office and then decided we would come by the new I.A. Smith store. And we decided we, uh, that we would have to ask for something. So one of the little girls said, well, we don't have any eggs in town. We will have to ask for eggs. So when we opened the door, the first thing I saw was a large cat piece with eggs. I let my friend walk ahead and ask, do you have any eggs? One of the first said, come on, baby. By that time, Steve had gotten up from the bed and walked up towards the fence, left us over. My friend told them that she would have to go back home to see how many her mother wanted. The next time I saw the good people, he asked me for a day and wanted to know if anyone had parties. I said, oh, yes, I replied, and we, we had parties called and play parties. We had had some after the Burton Brothers, and after we woke up. So this is where I saw Ms. Mod, um, Mod Terry for the first time, who is now Ms. Fred Lassie, that we had many parties at the mission after that. In September of 1899, I went to the in-house commission for Indian girls as one of the faculty members. Miss Van Pickett was principal, Miss Patton intermediate, Miss Lowe Parkinson primary teacher, and Miss May Holmes music teacher. May Holmes and I lived together. She was later was married to Walter De uh, Donnelly, and I lived in New York for many Donnelly and lived in New York for many years. The girls in one dormitory, the dormitory, close to me and myself, left to have some things when they should have been asleep. We would quite, quietly slip down the hall, open the door quickly, and every girl would say, sound asleep. To this day, we could never figure out how they knew we were coming to church. The girls would also crawl through the classroom and go visiting other girls on the second floor. We would make them go back the way they came, even though for some it was a tight squeeze for some of them. Miss Dallas B. Davis, daughter, attended school there. They were Myrtle, down in the Mary, May, Miss Lott, uh, Beth, Miss Vernon Piper, Irene, Miss W.S.T., Maud, Miss Mary Jones, Governor Brown's daughter, Alice, Miss Winfrey, and Percy, Miss Dick Harper. Brother Blake, head superintendent of the Omaha Commission, preached part time at the Indian Baptist Church, southeast of Europa. We would go with him and Wagon and to the church, and the sermons were long because they were, were translated by an interpreter. We enjoyed the dinner on the ground under the trees. The food was excellent, with much dry beef and salsa. Our mother, Medical Mason as a school would always pay her own food because she didn't want to wait for long to eat. My father said he didn't want to live in a town where they were not in and was not a Sunday school. So in 1898, he organized the first Sunday school in New York. The Sunday school was in the old Indian Council House, which is located in the Temple City, close to where the Othello Hammond School is now located. Alma and Alice Long were teachers in the Sunday school. The first Baptist church was organized in the courthouse on May 1st, 1900, where we had been holding services for some time. Brother Treadway from the pastor came on Sunday to preach. All the nominations worked for that. The church was organized the first Sunday in May 1900, the 13th starting Monday. I was at the Omaha Commission at the time, so I rode into the church with Brother as he helped us with the organization of the church. 
The Baptist Church was built in 1901, and the following 13 persons were so members. Uh, John C. Bridges, Ms. Lisa J. Bridges, T. C. Bridges, Grace C., Irene C., Ms. Mary A., L. K. Sampson, Mrs. L. K. Sampson, Carl Sampson, and Ms. Theodore Carl, Ethel Sampson, and J. E. Shepard, and Ms. J. E. Shepard. I watched the election of Governor Brown. Those in favor of electing him lined up in his seat with him. Those in favor of the other candidates lined up with him. Then the men were counted. I have seen two victims at the old Indian Hickory seat. I watched from the upstairs window across the street. They were sometimes severe. Their backs would be a bloody cross from the lashes. They were doctored by a national physician, which was Dr. Lynn at that time. He left, and Dr. Burr came from uh, the national physician. The last execution was before we came. The tree was left standing for several years. It was on the corner across the street, south from the city state line. Steve Douglas and Myra Harris, August 29, 1900, and was married by U.S. Commission Henry Pace in my parents' home at the Ranger Church during Mission. We have four children, two born in New York, and in territory, and two in New York, Oklahoma. They were Clara Douglas, now Fort Worth, Texas, Helen, now Ms. B.T. Larson, June, now Ms. Dick Cooper, and Stephen Douglas. Well, Ms. Lawson, that's quite an interesting resume, and I just wonder if you could tell me who, what uh, white families were here when you first moved here. I believe you said in 1864. I mean, your uh, people did. Just. Uh, in 1864, Mrs. Lilly was the first white person in uh, We Woke She was a uh, Presbyterian missionary. And then in 1866, E.J. Brown was commissioned to help bring the Seminole to Indian Territory earlier. But 1866, he established the trading post, a tree building south of Rio de Creek, which was in use until years later. And 1868, John Ross Ramsey established the Giant of a at three miles and a half south of North of Rio de uh, 1885, the Indian Baptist Church was established. My mother went to church there in uh, uh, later years when she was teaching uh, in the Hawker Mission. Mm -hmm. 1888, L.A. Elliott's wife and son came to leave over. She was the uh, uh, brother in law to my grandmother. Uh, he was from some land. I was so he leased it. 1894, uh, Emma Hawker Mission was set. And 1895, the A.T. Shaw family came to Wee Walker. They were later our neighbors. Uh, when I came into knowing what was going on. And 1896, uh, the Arthur Sharan. And then my grandparents and my mother and her sisters and brothers came in 1897. And um, I believe that's all right. Too, they used the Methodist Church was built then, and uh, they used the church for classrooms, and then a building downtown, uh, up over a vacant room, up over a building up downtown. The, they uh, also had two in that, and then uh, they built in 1904 what we call the Little Red School House. And it was used until about 1907. 1905, they started a new brick, three-story brick school um, house. And it was finished in about 1907. And I started school there in 1909. Well, Ms. Lawson, can you remember uh, back to your early childhood, what is the first memory you have of We Woke Up? Well, the 
first memory of we woke up, I, I remember our neighborhood. We had, it was very pleasant. I had, we had a, fair, a good many children in the neighborhood. We were all congenial. And we uh, took buggy rides, ferry rides. Our folks took us on picnics, uh, neighborhood groups. And it was always a happy memory. And then I remember being in a, when I was three, year, uh, three years old, I was in a Thompson way. And uh, that's really the first time I ever re remembered anything to start with. And um, I remember that um, I, I got with sick when I was old because of, of all excitement. But I was a little flower girl. And you would never imagine that the little flower girl with a little bony leg was me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember when, uh, later on when I was a little older, in 1910, it was in August, one particular day, that the Lady Day was to meet with my mother. And on this day, the Douglas household was to stir quite early. Lady Day was to meet with mama that afternoon, and there was still a lot to do before the August heat took hold. Mama had made the lady's egg cake the night before. There was still a freezer of ice cream to freeze. And Mama said, Helen, run over to Miss Shaw's and borrow her ice cream freezer. Then you can get your practicing done. I was struggling with piano lessons, and I had almost perfected the piece, Go Tell Ain't Rody. Go Tell Ain't Rody. Go Tell Ain't Rody. Her old gray goose is dead. As I played the last line over and over, the tune could be heard wafting out over the still hot summer air. Faltering it came out, her old gray goose was dead. We had an early lunch, <coughs> and the ladies' aid began to gather about two o'clock that afternoon. It was a big day, because the ladies didn't dare leave the children home, so they brought them along. We simply had a picnic. Mama had a, made up a pitcher of lemonade, so she sat outside and latched the screen. There was no need for us to go into the house as the houses were not modern. Now they were ready to sit back and study about the poor heathens in Africa while we ran ramp out pant over the city block that Papa owned. Can I stop now? <coughs> we children decided to play follow the leader. We chose the one that we thought would be more daring. Our trail led up and over the barn, in and under the house. We took the wash house apart and the ones with long hair were running the ring as far as we could go without being killed. Papa was a tinker, a mechanic, and a man of inventive ambition. We had an acetylene light plant. Here we whiled away some of our time in and around the carbide cans, while out without disastrous results. Then realizing that the water tank over the light plant was being filled from the windmill, we investigated the source of the water supply. The dare was to climb to the top of the windmill and back down, having, having, back down, having done this, we refreshed ourselves at the pump. And there's nothing that tastes better than cool, clean water out of the pump with a faint tinge of oil. Papa kept everything well oiled. While resting from our trip up the windmill, we gradually worked our way around to the side yard. Here Papa had built a flying guinea. He had recently bought a new carpet with tobacco tags and the discarded crate with Papa's aptness for workmanship and originality, we had a flying jenny that was none surpassed outside of a circus. There was a slight difference. The cir circus one was pulled by a real live jenny. Our sense of timing seemed to be one of second nature. We sensed a stirring among the ladies and knew they were about to put aside their study of the poor heathen until the next meeting. The songbooks were being passed around. There were some beautiful singers in the bunch, and they loved to sing. Papa had taken down our old wooden banisters on our front porch and built beautiful concrete ones with a sort of gothic, gothic arch. There we had gathered to wait the final song and benediction along. Also, we had visions of ice cream and that big lady day cake made by Mrs. Shaw, our neighbor's recipe. The cake was called Lady's Egg Cake because it was big enough to serve all the ladies and the children of age society. We had just enough time to take turns sticking our heads through the arch on the porch. 
everyone, everything was going along smoothly. Heads were popping in and out. The ladies were on their last verse of, yes, we'll get at the river. When we hit the snag, one little girl who wasn't as pinheaded as the rest couldn't seem to get her head out. When she realized her plight, she let out an unearthly scream. Yes, we'll get her at the river, wavered and stopped in midair. I remember standing back horrified and thinking Papa's beautiful concrete archboard. After much, much turning and twisting and breathing, her head finally slipped out. The next time the meeting met at our house, before the ladies started their study on what to do to help Peter, they just started off the meeting saying, how firm, how firm a foundation. That was our cue to stay away from those Gothic banisters. <laughs> Well, Ms. Lawson, it seems to me that your life here in Wewoka was one of the typical, nice, easy-moving, American family-style existence, and I'm sure you must have had many pleasant times. Could you recall some of those, beginning with your old, uh, the little red schoolhouse on up through high school and on up to recently, present time? Yeah, I remember going to school with my brother in 19, and, well, it couldn't be been 1904, it was about and uh, uh, in the, he was going to school in the little red schoolhouse where they had the double desk, she sat in the desk, and he wanted me to visit school with him, so his mother let me go. And one of them would entertain me and draw pictures for me while the other just pretended to be studying, I'm sure. Was that on the double desk basis? Yes. Yeah, on the double desk, and then the other one... He would to work just like everything to make the teacher think he's busy while the other one was entertaining me. And then I, I started to school in um, 1909. And um, there wasn't too eventful. I enjoyed my teachers, which was Mrs. Ion Patterson. And uh, also uh, Ms. B.B. B. Lack. I think she lives in Oklahoma City now. And um, so uh, there was, I just had a pleasant school life from there on up to high school. And of course, we had all of our high school activities. And um, going to football games and basketball and, and track events. And uh, we made them all. I do remember at one football game that um, we had an open field for the football and there was an open field at one side and a man always planted turnips there every year in the fall about they were just about right when football time came around and in between we'd run out and pull up the turnip he planted enough turnips for us, us all to eat a raw turnip and we'd go out and pull up the turnip and eat it while we were watching the game and uh, then we uh, I can't walk yet. Our best form of entertainment and fun was uh, a weenie. We had lots and lots of weenie rows, but uh, we always called the bluff. And that now is a real exclusive uh, residential area. So we walked many a time over the bluff and had weenie rows. And uh, on the way over there, there was an open well in front of the house, and we always stopped there and threw a penny in and made a wish on the way. And then we, um, for entertainment on Sundays, was generally we went Kodaking up the railroad track, a bunch of boys and girls. That's when we began to notice boys. And... Do you remember any Halloween pranks that were ever played in Wewoka? Oh, yes. I recall one. Some of the boys, they got a... It was Halloween fell on Friday that year, and they found a cow and a calf right across the street from the um, school. And they put the cow and calf up in the belfry tower of the um, school. And uh, of course, they stayed there till uh, next Monday. The man that the cow belonged to could hear her bawling, but he never could find her. <laughs> and so, of course, we were all really uh, real tickled about it. But the main reason was we couldn't have school that Monday. <laughs> it's fortunate she had the calf with her. The cow had the calf with her. Well, Ms. Lawson, before we started this interview, you were talking to me something about 
a pecan grove that was near here, and I think some of the experiences you related there would be interesting right here. Well, the pecan grove was started about a block, city block, from behind our house, and our folks wouldn't dare let it, um, the younger children go down there. It was such a thicket and a tent, and it was dangerous. There was also some wild animals down there. And, but my brother, she let my brother go with uh, uh, several other boys. And one day they were down there and run across, uh, found a, a man dead in some deep uh, bushes. He was an Indian and um, lost my train of thought. Well, did they ever find out uh, what had happened to him? No, they never did. Um, my brother was, they were told to be cautious the next time they went. Of course, they were glad that they found him before, you know, that he deteriorated. But um, they, as far as a smaller children going to the Con Grove, we had to have older people to go with us. So the friend, uh, got on and uh, B. Shaw, went with us and their boyfriend. They were grown and they were quite a bit older than we were and we took big dish pans and went down and picked the most gorgeous violets. They were yellow and white and purple as well as I remember. It might, it might have been my child's eyes that they looked so big, but they were just beautiful. I, don't know. I believe you mentioned, Ms. Lawson, that one reason your brother was down in the thicket quite frequently uh, was because he was interested in nature and was writing a book. Is this correct? Yes, he was interested in, I guess, in the flora and the fauna, fauna of the, and he was writing a book on uh, trees and shrubs and uh, that grew back there in the, the Congo, and also gathering bark to put on the back of his book. And that was the first book he had ever written. He, from the time he was a small boy, he, that was what he wanted to do, was to be a writer. And uh, he had written five books. Uh, his latest book, uh, he died before it was finished, and it was, would have been his death. It was on uh, religious persecution. But his wife is going to try to have it, someone uh, publish it. And then he wrote Cattle Kings of Texas and Gentlemen in the White Hat and uh, Texas Navy and several other books that uh, I don't have to have right now. I let him have them back one time because his burn, his library burn. But um, can you raise that? <laughs> I, I can't. Uh, do you recall, Ms. Lawson, uh, another little incident you were telling about your brother and his newspaper work in Oklahoma City before he went to Fort Worth? Well, he always wanted to be a reporter, so they told him he went and applied at the Daily Oklahoma, and they said they didn't need one. He said, well, he would just work for nothing in order to learn it. And um, so his uh, first scoop was... Um, when they impeached Governor Walton. And he went down to the Huckins Hotel and they were turning the supporters away, but um, he happened to look over and, uh, or rather, General Key was there. And uh, he hollered at my brother because uh, General Key used to live at Lee Walton. And we grew up as children when him and his wife lived here. And um, so, he hugged it, my brother, and said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I came for a story. So that's the way he got his uh, first break in um, newspaper work. Well, Ms. Lawson, no, I, I'm very happy you did, and it sounds to me like you had a very lovely life here, and I would assume that uh, Having lived here all your life, you know almost everybody in Lewoka, don't you? Well, you'd be surprised. I used to. But we have some new ones in, younger generation that I don't know. But, uh, of course, I used to. We knew everybody. 
And even doing the oil business. Mm -hmm. I'm your buddy, too. Well, that sounds like uh, the story I've heard from two others this morning, that uh, although they had lived here a long time, that as they get up in age, they, uh, the younger generation sort of falls apart, and they don't seem too interested in us more elderly people. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for a most interesting interview, Ms. Lawson, and this is Rowan Kearns interviewing Mrs. Helen Douglas Lawson, at Wewoka, Oklahoma, on November 18, 1971. Uh, this is Penn Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. The date is November the 18th, 1971. We're at the First Baptist Church at Wewoka, Oklahoma, uh, doing interviews with uh, the pioneer people of the Wewoka area. Uh, today we're talking with Mrs. Lydia Bruner and Mrs. Ruby Roberts Hurley. And we will talk, visit first with Mrs. Bruner. I think that to start with, I'd like to find out where you are from, uh, who your parents were, and when they first came here. Well, I, I've lived here, born and read here. I've been here all my life. My parents, they're Johnson, but uh, they're, they're the Oklahoma. To uh, you, were, you were first here in this area, so I'm here. Well, now, I'm 79 years old, and I've been here all, 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 all the time. You've been here since about 1892 or 3. Now, you, you came here, uh, you first remember we woke up then around the turn of the century. Oh, yeah. And, uh, why don't you describe we woke as it was when you first remembered the turn of the century? Well, when I first remember, I could remember the old coat house, not the one that's there now. There was just a little old uh, frame building. And there was an old tree standing in front of the coat house. When any crime would be committed with anyone, could commit a crime, they would uh, have something that hang that person up, not to kill, they whip. They, that's the right as they punish me during that time. They'd hang them up on the tree with both hands up like that, then down in a pole up on his feet. Then they'd give him so many lash for the crime that he committed. Uh, about what was the say? Say a person stole a chicken. What? How many crime? How many lash? Well, I wouldn't know. I you wouldn't know that. No, no. I didn't know. But I know they still got lash for it. Uh, they sure did. The, uh, uh, would they be sentenced to this? Would they? Uh, would the uh, judge sentence them to these lashes, or would these? Uh, yes, the judge would sentence them to get so many lashes, you know, of the crime that they committed, and it would be with a. Uh, it wouldn't be now with whips and things, but little a switch they call hickory, hickory switch. It's a little keen like a limb, long limb, with the jeez with the lash on their back. Did you see any of the lashes? Yes, I've seen it. I've seen some of them. See if some of them, maybe somebody stole a cow, a horse. Now, they were very strict on your stealing, such like that. Cow, a horse, a hog, something like that. And we had lots of them would do that, too. The, uh, now, what else can you remember during the early Well, period? I could remember the time they would, uh, Travel didn't have cars to go in. We had covered wagons, and old horses and mules and go along and go far and near in those covered wagons. We would go to church in those wagons with our children. Sometimes we'd walk. Sometimes we'd walk a mile, and children would walk a mile to go to school. What about when the rain came up? Did you gather stuff? Oh, yes. Uh, <coughs> when the rain came up, I lived in, uh, out in the rural during that time, and I would have to come to town in the wagon. And this old, this river right here, we woke at Creek, we call it. I remember the time it was just swimming. From bank to bank, we couldn't see the bridge on there, but we'd cross over, come into town, cross, swim, cross, going back. I heard there were times you couldn't get across the Creek. You had to swim across it, if you did. The, uh, yeah, what about the animals getting stuck? Did they ever get stuck oh, in the Oh, yes, yes, they did. Did you describe what that was like? 
Well, they would get down in that in the water, you know, it was so high, water was swimming, so overflowing, and they would try to cross over, and some could make it, some can't. They just couldn't be just swimming, just sunk till they died. Mm -hmm. Now, you uh, had some close connection with Cootie Johnson, isn't it? Yes. Uh, tell me, what was your relationship? Well, uh, I am his adopted sister, Cootie's adopted sister. Why don't you tell us about Cootie Johnson? We, we really have very little on that. Well, he was, he was really a smart attorney now. He was slow, but uh, he was really a graft out of that much. Now, I've got, just got this to say that he has uh, cheated many and many poor people out of their homes, land. Where did he come from? Who, Cootie? Yes. Well, he was born here, I guess. I think he was a Seminole. His dad was a Seminole. But I think his mother was Creek. And um, he adopted me and two sisters, three, three of us. And that's when he uh, filed, where they call it, filed, enroll us, you know, to get out home. And uh, we were on the Indian road. Me and my sister, me and two of my sisters. And, uh, well, we got up and he would send us to school, and that's when he was taking our home. He just robbed us. And he even had my, my restriction removed from being, you know, during that time, he, the Indians, they had the allotment, but they had one 40 acres that they were allowed to keep. They couldn't sell, but Cootie had the restriction removed off mine so he could sell it. The, uh... Where did, uh, where was he educated? Was he, uh... Who, Cootie? Yeah. I don't know where Cootie was educated. I really did he, don't. Was he a lawyer also? But he was sure educated then. Was he, was he lawyer, was he lawyer for one of the railroads? Not that I know not, of. I didn't know. Uh, not that I know of. He and Guy could live for real partners in both. And, uh, Maynard, and Patterson, Davis. Oh, and several more I could name, I could remember. Partners. Now, was he Seminole, was he part Seminole? Or? Part Seminole and Creek. Creek. His mother was Creek, his dad was Seminole. Uh, what part of you? Creek. You're Creek. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I'm Creek. The, uh, um, can you recall the things that, so take the period from about 1900 to 1910, that the, probably the early period you remember, you know, these early days. What events that took place in this area can you think of that were outstanding, that were well, particularly memorable? Let's see, can I remember? Uh, he passed away, it was 19, I think it was 1927. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I think that's the time he passed. He took real sick. Well, I was thinking of events in the town or in the area that happened that, that you were particularly memorable to. No, I just can't think. No, nothing. That's right, the Johnson School, but that's been there for years. Well, he, he donated uh, acreage to that uh, community for a school. We first had school in a little log cabinet until he donated that acreage. They built a little frame building on there, and that's where we had our school. And then he add on to that a church, and we set a little church off from that. He did that. Why don't you describe living in the area of the 1900s, what it was like? I, I know that there were the log cabins and that you... And the, and the traveling going? Tell us that. Well, it was just uh, in wagons, mm -hmm. no cars. What about the homes, though? Well, the homes were not uh, modern like they are now. You know, we didn't have one at home, so we just worked, and all those that who did farm, raised little cows and chickens, like that, cotton corn. You lived on the Johnson farm, didn't you, for a period of time? No, I lived on my own. You lived on your own? On my own. I never did live on Johnson's farm. The, uh, uh, I understood that, uh, you know, that, that of course, the homes uh, at that time, you, uh, I, I understood that from one of the other interviews that they would, in the log cabins that uh, they would tear out, they'd, they'd pull out the, during the, they, were you in a log cabin during these early periods? No, I never lived in a log cabin. You never no, worked? Never, never, never did. I see. Uh -huh. Cootie and his 
his parents, Kuda's parents, they were kind of wealthy people. Mm -hmm. and they, they, like I say, they, none of them ever lived in those cabins, and they read me out read it for them. The, uh, uh, who were some of the Creek uh, uh, hierarchy, or some of the their chiefs or others that you knew? Now, the chief that I knew, let's see now, can I think? I think it was the Macintosh at one, one time. Mm -hmm. Which Macintosh was it? No Macintosh father? Well, I guess so. He was a Macintosh, mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you remember what his first name was? No, I don't. Uh, could you, what could you tell about Chief Macintosh? Well, all I know is just that he was the chief mm -hmm. of the Indian tribe. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he was the son. You know, one of the Macintoshes was killed that. by the... Uh, he was, I think he was a son. Probably the father of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, uh, did, you, uh, did you participate in, in any of the Creek uh, Tribal Council uh, ceremonies or anything? Yes, I usually go sometimes to them. Well, we would gather and we would have the little meetings and talk about the head right, they call it, the, 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 the cap of payment. That's right. His big head ride. The, uh, what about the tribal dances? Did you ever take oh, part in those? Oh, yes, they did. But I've never taken part in it, but I, I know they, I went to them. And another dance is called the Green Corn Dance. Mm -hmm. They would have that, too. Uh, did the term from the Green Corn Rebellion come from the Green Corn Dance? It did mm -hmm. not. No. There's no connection. Uh -huh. I don't did you? Do you, uh, do you know anything about the Green Corn Rebellion? Mm -hmm. Well, let's switch here, and I will vi I, I'm going to visit. We're going to come back to you, but uh, I want to visit with, uh, let's see, you're Ms. Hurley, mm -hmm. and okay. Ruby Hurley. We're switching over there, and we want to talk a little about the Green Corn Rebellion. Why don't you tell us what it was? Uh, I uh, originated from down in the Sasakwa area, which is in the southern part of the county, and this uh, Green Corn Rebellion wa was a... Uh, Oh, they were opposed to the young men going to World War I. So they uh, organized um, and they bought up all the ammunition and guns and everything in the whole county. And Governor Brown's home was out west of town. And they had planned on that being their fort. And uh, really, it was called the WCU. And that was meant working class union. That's where it originated. So they was all armed and all, and they were uh, stationed back west, well, it'd be north and west of Sasakwa. They had, uh, they had camped out there, and they ran out of food, and I remember they uh, killed one of my brother's uh, cows, and they had cooked that up for the meat. They had run out of food, and uh, Mr. Wyatt, and the corn was just in roasting ear, you know, at that, and so there was a ridge over there, called it a, a ridge, a part of some land over there, and they had, uh, they uh, was all, they were all settled around in this ridge, and they were eating this corn, this raw roasting ear, and they, that's where the name came from, the the uh, roast near ridge rebellion, and so they had uh, a old law laws from uh, and judges from all over. Oklahoma that came to help to corral them and I remember in our neighborhood I was from the farm and my father's name was Bond, Joe Bond and we lived north of Sasakwa about three, about four miles and then my brother lived just south of us and on this uh, and then one other family, uh, Mr. Spears, Joe Spears, we were about the only people in that neighborhood that didn't belong to this. So these uh, laws and all would come, you know, uh, uh, with their guns and all to try to corral them and we, my mother would cook for them and fix them They would uh, sleep on our porch They'd come in and had been out all night and they'd sleep on our porch and mama would give them quilts and, and my brother lived just uh, down the road and they had a lot of grass in the yard and they'd give them quilts and my sister-in-law would help cook and all for this uh, For these officers he was trying to corral them and uh, they had uh, they were all dressed in the regalia with red ribbons all over them. And, and I think there was one man shot. And they had no trouble. They finally, you know, I got them all corralled and all. 
And in all, there were several hundred that, had, that belonged to this organization. How widespread was the Green Corn Rebellion? Well, it was, uh, I would say, it was in a radius of about 10 miles. And I remember my father was a farmer, and he was west of town. Uh, and he baled hay for people, you know, and he had this, uh, had all this crew over there, and he didn't know about it. And someone came over on the horse and gave the news, and so he uh, just turned everything loose, and he rushed home because uh, my mother and I were alone. And so they tried to, they went in town, tried to buy, buy ammunition. There wasn't any ammunition, but they bought it all up and all. And a lot of men from we walked over who passed on were interested in it and helped out Judge Norval and Uncle Bill Cross and just a bunch of old timers. The, um, the this ended about when did this break up the Green Corner Bay? I think it was about 1917 during the World War One. I, yeah. I think seven 1917 mm -hmm. and 18. But they were very. Um, Oh, insecure and ignorant. You know, they they really didn't know. They had no how possibly compared to some of the demonstrations of today? Well, yes, I like some they have today. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, they were ignorant most of them. And I remember, <coughs> and some and some of my folks had this. Have, they have this book. My mother kept a scrapbook, and a lot of these people were arrested. You know, and they were brought into the county jail. And uh, they had written letters back home to their wives, you know, down to Fox and down the Ram, you know, and telling that they what a mistake they had made and all. And they were printed in the we woke a paper. And uh, I have a, uh, my niece had a, a try to get this, uh, from her and, uh, a copy of these letters that these individuals had written home to their wives, telling them, you know, what the you trouble. You still have this scrapbook? Yes, uh, my niece has it. She uh -huh. lives in Texas, and I'm trying to get it. Mm -hmm. if, if you could, I, I want to get your address, because I want to, to okay. what I'd like to do is to put some of this on slides, you know, because yes. it's, uh -huh. it's an interesting it's story. Uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh -huh. There's not too many uh, people left that knows about this. Mm -hmm. The, uh, I want to, uh, I, I, while, while we're, while, while I'm talking with, uh, uh, Ms. Bruner, uh, you might write your address down so that I can be in contact with you and we'll try to follow up on that. The, uh, thinking in terms of uh, the, uh, oh, oh, particularly in the, uh, uh, in the area of the Creek Nation, were you, have you, were you active in any way other than attending the tribal councils? Did you, did you participate in any of the tribal things in the Creek Nation? No, nothing. I only go to the meetings. Uh, what uh, what do you recall during the er, oh say the period between World War uh, between 1910 and uh, 1920? Can you recall any particular things, any events that were outstanding? It could be something that came to town, like a circus or a uh, an important personage or something like that that was a highlight. Um, The, the stomp, the stomp dances, they call it the stomp dances. And what were the stomp dances? The Indian dances. Yes. They just, you know, they'd have a fire and they, you know, and they'd dance around that fire and they'd sing mm -hmm. and they'd have bells on the ankles and mm -hmm. long, long dresses. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, everything yeah. else. Uh, do you recall anything, uh, in the uh, in the area of 19 uh, oh the 1920s, do you think of anything? Well, in the 20s, they would have these picnics, such like that. Yeah. They would have these picnics, and they all would gather Indians and colors, and all would go to them. And some whites would be in the bunch, the old pioneers, you know, and they'll dance, and then they'd get some of them would get bad and they'd fight and. Yeah, they have killed too in these old places. There was a great mixture, wasn't there, uh, in the uh, quite a number between the colored and, and the and the creek. 
and the Seminole. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 In those uh, in those particular yeah. areas. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, when did the uh, when did the uh, carp begin to migrate into that area? Was it after the Civil War? That, oh, uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. Following that, uh, that they, so many migrated into yes, that. Yes. that. That, I guess, is why now uh, so many of them uh, came into, uh, well, from Mr. Murray came, his family from Louisiana, mm -hmm. a number from Then you Yes, from so, yeah, huh, mm -hmm. yeah. Then they would come in and intermarry, you know, mm -hmm. as Yes, they did. They in the back. Yeah, they all are similar. Well, I said uh, many of the similar had colored blood. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. Most of them are creeks. Most of them are creeks. Were there uh, uh, thinking in this area? Where, of course, you know, right now we go through uh, various racial turmoils. I guess I always have and always will of different sorts. Were Were there? Uh, were there any, during the early period there, was there any racial turmoil? No, uh, I think it was, I didn't ever, uh, yeah. There was not. No. Uh, I wonder, I wonder why there was not. No, I wonder what, what there was that kept there from being when there is under other circumstances. Do you know what, uh, uh, how, uh, how they averted that hurdle? Well, I guess it's because we all were living just as one, we just said one. Mm -hmm. And I think the background of the Indian too, uh, you know, when of course they were both minority races. This uh -huh. is one. Yes, thing. Uh -huh. and, and that's that, right. So there was this in common. And then uh, this the governor, you know, I mean, he's governor down. He mm -hmm. knows his background. You know, and they're all talking about these women. They could be kind of scared. It's kind of, it's kind of a piece of it. And they, they didn't want to start any wicked things. Mm -hmm. What was your church? church? Baptist. Baptist Church. Uh, and uh, what's your church now? Is it, uh, Baptist. Baptist. Mm -hmm. uh, which Baptist Church is it? Are you in this one? Or, uh, no, it's one? out in the rural. In the rural. Baptist Pil church. Pilgrim Rest Baptist. The what? Pilgrim Rest Baptist. Pilgrim Rest Baptist. Baptist. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, which Baptist is that associated with? Is that associated with Southern Baptist? Is it associated with American? Or is it associated with Independent? Okay. Independent. 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 Uh -huh. Independent. The, have you been in that particular congregation for many years? Yes. Tell us something about that church. Well, it, it is a nice little church. It, uh, we first had church in the school, at the school that uh, Cootie donated to us for church and school also. Then later on, he gave us a spot for, for us to build a church, and we got a good pastor, and he stayed with us until this church was built, $8,000. Paper, I assume. Now it's just a nice little community mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. the, uh, can you think of any particular church activities or events that were uh, unusual or outstanding? Nothing but good service. Mm -hmm. We would have homecoming every year. We'll all meet together and we'd raise money and have big dinner. Mm -hmm. Singing, quartet, different preachers come in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, always been on the ground. Uh, do you think of any areas in addition to that country? No, I think that's very fair. Well, let's swing again. We'll go back again to uh, Ms. Uh, Hurley. Uh, I, I, we, we talked about the Green Corn Rebellion, but let's swing. When did you first get into the Wewoka area? Born and raised in Seminole County. And I came to work in Seminole County in, uh, in the uh, late 20s. Mm -hmm. And I worked in the county clerk's office as a deputy. And uh, prior to that, I taught school. I, I taught uh, school here in Seminole County. And uh, I was, I've been, I've held a public office. Uh, what office did you hold? I was county clerk for about six terms. And uh, at present, I'm secretary of the county election board. And uh, I was, but I was born, I, I was re reared down in the south end of the county, which is about 14 or 15 miles. And uh, my father was uh, Joe Bond, and uh, he came to Oklahoma, or came to Indian Territory. Of course, I was born in Indian Territory, too. And, but they settled in around Sasaqua. And we lived, and among the Indians, uh, there was only two or three 
white family, and we lived, the first, the house where I was born was a log house, and it had once been a um, house for uh, the light horseman, which was uh, the same as the sheriff's house. It was a large house. We had uh, uh, about five rooms. That was in the long porches and fireplaces and all. And we lived there, and that, <coughs> the, I can remember out in front of the house, there was four or uh, five big sycamore trees, and those rasps were dug, and were driven in those trees, and they used to tie the prisoners there, you know, when they'd bring, and then in one of the rooms, we always called this the hut room, <laughs> my mother gave it this name, I don't know why, but anyway, you could raise up about ten planks in this room, and there was a dungeon down in there, just a square place, it was about ten or twelve feet deep. And I had a ladder, and my mother would go down there and uh, keep her fruit down in there on this ladder, you know. I'd been so scared I wouldn't go down there for anything. And uh, uh, we lived there, and I said, until, oh, I was about 12, and then we, my father built a home then, uh, just within a mile of this place. And so that's where I lived all my life. The earliest uh, period you remember in uh, this, this county was about what period? You I want to get it if you first visualize it. What was it like when you first saw it? When I first saw yes, yes, well, yes. I can remember <coughs> uh, just a small child but, uh, living in this territory in this, among the Indians that they would bring uh, oh, uh, wild strawberries and green onions and, and soft key. That was something they made of corn. And they'd want to exchange. My father was a rancher and a farmer, and we always had lots of cattle. And they'd come to get eggs and want to exchange, barter eggs and uh, milk and butter and things like that and meat. And I learned the language pretty well. I could, I know about you know words, about all the words, but I don't make sentences too well. And then uh, uh, I remember the first school that I attended. My father and uncle built this school. My father, and it was, the name of it was Kite School. My grandmother taught in the school, the subscription school. And that was my first school that I attended. And my grand, I went to school to my grandmother, and the school still stands. So they have, of course, they built a brick. They, they don't have school, but the building still stands. You were elected county clerk, weren't you? That was yes, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, had, had there been other women elected to office in your party? Uh, there had been one other woman that had been elected court clerk. I was the first lady county clerk. Mm -hmm. uh, did you feel uh, uh, did, did you feel that being a woman was a handicap in that election or an asset? Uh, it was a handicap, <laughs> uh, but uh, I overcame the handicap. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you attribute uh, overcoming? I mean, what uh, did, were there any particular things in the election that helped you? Yes, uh, there'd been a tragedy in my home. My husband was killed, and I was left a widow, and I think that had a lot to do with being elected. How old were you elected? 1936. Mm -hmm. You started about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. What were the important events that occurred during your period in office there? Uh, I was in uh, a part of the oil boom. When I worked as a clerk in there, I was doing the oil boom. And we had so much recording, and this county boomed up. We were the third largest in the county at one time. We was number three on the license plate. And uh, then uh, uh, the depression came, and uh, so many people were on trying to, you know, were on relief and trying to get food. They were. It was a terrible crisis right into uh, say 19 and. The end of it was 36 and 37 there, but it was pretty bad. Why don't you talk about Oklahoma during the, or the Woka area during the oil boom? What happened? Oh my, this county boomed up to about 89,000 people. And uh, the main street, there was no pavement. And I heard a fellow once say he saw an animal drowned <laughs> on main street of Wewoka. It wasn't very much of a town then. It was more of a colored town until the boom came, and uh, we had no sidewalks. They had the plank sidewalks and had this small courthouse, and of course it just boomed up. This is at one time, one of the, the largest oil field in the world here in Seminole County, in and around we woke up over in Seminole. The royalty sold as high as ten thousand dollars an acre, in, in a lot of the places, and uh, 
it, it really boomed and they built the courthouse and they built better churches and, and, and store buildings and it just really shot right up. It also brought in some wild entertainment, I guess. All oh yes, brought in wild entertainment. You know, that always goes with it. Mm -hmm. And we had several booms, you know, in this county. Cromwell, for example, that was a, uh, it was just a small town. It, at one time there was 10 or 15,000 people out there. And they got some real good wells. And it came from Cromwell to Weewoka. And then Weewoka, it uh, was over in Seminole and Bow Legs and through there, that area. And there were so many oil wells everywhere you'd look, you wouldn't know um, which way to turn. Secretary of the County Election Board, I know you're a, cl a close friend, obviously, of uh, Senator Al Nichols. Oh, T yeah. Tell us something about Senator Al Nichols. Well, he's really an old timer, and he's been in office for many, many years. And my appointment always comes through the, came through the state senator, which Al Nichols, and uh, he's uh, at present our county, I mean our state senator. But he's, um, I don't know. He's says he's running again, so I, I, Probably <laughs> I, don't, know sure. I don't know for sure. But they're taking in all this extra territory. I don't know if the district is taking in about three other well, counties. There are Chandler, I know. Chandler and um, Logan, Logan and Lincoln and Potawatomi and Seminole County. He and Senator Farrell are now the same. Uh -huh. And Senator Nichols is a fine man, so really a fine man. Uh -huh. Both he and his opponents are good friends. Of, of you. And, uh, Don Farrell, both he and Don Farrell are good friends. Yes, they're real good friends. They're different uh -huh. parties. Too. Different parties. Uh, uh, Al Nichols is a Democrat race. and Farrell is a Republican. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Be quite yeah. a race. Mm -hmm. It would be a race and probably it would be a general election race rather than, yes, a, race. Rather than a primary. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people don't want to get into that because that would really be, you really have to campaign because you wouldn't know where you where you stood, you know, mm -hmm. cut up so. Both do. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've met Miss Farrell. He's a very fine very man. Fine. Very fine man. And mm -hmm. one's young, one's old. One's old. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, can you think of any other highlights that we have a little, just a couple of minutes of tape left, and can you think of any, uh, any other highlights in, of your career you think we ought to put down or other uh, n things you recall that we ought to put down? I don't think of anything. We, um, I taught school in this county. I don't think I... Yes, I told that. And I, I, I came in, uh, I was teaching school, and I came uh, and worked in the, court, in the uh, county clerk's office one summer, just for, that for in places to replace those that were on vacation. And I liked it so well, I never went back to teaching. I just started, <laughs> <laughs> I just I turned out to be a politician. I just stayed with that for years, oh, yeah. mm -hmm, and I enjoyed it very much. It's been a very nice interview. With the, the, I've just finished visiting with uh, uh, Mrs. Ruby Roberts Hurley, and in between we have visited with uh, Mrs. Lydia Bruner, and certainly thank both of you.